Hi, I'm Annie Evans, and I am the Director of Education and Outreach for the New American History Project at the University of Richmond. Hopefully you watched the earlier video that I shared, which gave just an overview of our many tools and resources. Um, and also, before you look at this particular video, I hope you've already looked at Justin's video where he gave you a lot of great in-depth analysis on mapping inequality, which is one of our probably most downloaded resources from American Panorama, our digital atlas. So if you haven't had an opportunity to view Justin's video yet, go ahead and pause this one and come back to it after you have watched Justin's because I'm gonna be sharing learning resources that we developed based on that map. Okay, so if you're still listening, then I assume you have already watched Justin's video and then you are now ready to talk a little bit about how you might use that amazing resource in your classroom. So um, if you watch my earlier video, I first introduced you to our website, New American History, and kind of walked you through our homepage, um, used the menu to show how you can explore topics by era, by location, uh, by edition, and then you already have a good overview of our uh, premier resources, which are Bunk History, the connection tool for using current events as a jumping off point through space and time to look at how history and, and all of our collective stories are integrated. And you spent a good bit of time on Panorama as well, both through my video, uh, the Twitter activities that we did if you participated and through Justin's. So I feel like now you're in a really good place to jump into some of the learning resources. So um, if I were to click here, it takes you out to our learning resources page. Um, I kind of talked in the earlier video about how you can search by learning topic, by Lexile or reading levels, grade level standards and teaching strategies. And also showed you the newest features in our learning resource library, which are in the trending with teachers section. And then if you scroll down, you can go to viewing all the resources, um, or you can also do a search by learning topic, which would lead you to mapping inequality. So this is what I like to call the educator view of our learning resources. Um, you'll always know that you're in the educator view because it will say there that it says for educators and also because an educator view you're kind of in this nice vanilla colored um, uh, template here and you also have the student view which this button takes us out to how the learning resource is presented for students so you automatically notice you kind of know that you're in the student view because it says for students and also the template turns a dark blue so that you know now that this would be the, the student facing resource as you would present it in Google Classroom or Canvas or whatever LMS you're using to share digital resources. So uh, if you're ever like, hmm, is this, is this what the kids are looking at or is this what I'm using for my planning? Make sure that you're using the, uh, the version that you like. So really there's not a huge difference between the educator view and the student view, but the main difference is students really don't care what the standards are that you're addressing or teaching this week. Um, they don't need to know the suggested grade level or the time framework or the materials because that's really our job as the teacher. So that's different. Also, the read for understanding section for students is very brief. Uh, short description of the activity that they are about to engage in whereas the teacher view has teaching tips it talks a little bit about the selected activities and resources that we used uh, and so really you don't want to bog the students down with that information but you do have after that pretty much the same view that the students have the step-by-step -step directions so that you as the teacher in your planning can kind of follow along and um, decide which activities you're going to be able to have time or uh, closely align with what your goal is. So our learning resources are based on a five E's curriculum model, but I did want to show you um, as you scroll through them, um, this website 
uses um, some really great map features to present images. And so it's always going to resize them. You'll see these gray bars occasionally on the side. And that's where they have resized the image to make sure that it has maximum clarity and is the best quality uh, available for whatever device you happen to be on. So it may look different on a smartphone versus a tablet versus a Chromebook versus a, a laptop. I did wanna point out here towards the bottom, this is also not included in the student view, but we always share our learning resources as an editable Google Doc. So um, if you were to go to that, you'd have to be signing to Google, of course, but um, if you were signing to Google, it would take you to the Google version of this document where let's say you're teaching uh, students with disabilities who have certain modifications on their IEP, or you're teaching English language learners who may not be able to access the entire lesson, but you could perhaps extract certain activities and then reword them, um, maybe change the vocabulary slightly to adapt it to your needs. So we, we wanna make sure that we're presenting this in as many different ways that will be most useful to you as the teacher. And then of course, uh, the teacher tips here that are included are not appearing on the student view. So that's just kind of a, a little bit of a difference in what you're gonna get in the teacher versus the student view. But the heart of the lesson is going to be the same on both versions. Um, so as you are planning, if you're not familiar with the 5 E's model, the 5 E's model is based on, uh, kind of start off as a STEM uh, type learning model, but very quickly realized it was just grounded in really good pedagogy and we would be able to adapt it for other curriculum areas. I know there's some states, I believe Texas uses the 5 E's model for all of their content areas in their statewide curriculum. So uh, I'm gonna go ahead and move us back over to the student view. Uh, and so the idea behind um, mapping inequality and studying redlining with students is to, first of all, we always wanna front load the vocabulary that they're going to encounter during the learning resource uh, to make sure that we're kind of all speaking a common language uh, and also to, introduce new topics such as restrictive covenants that are not typically taught in most textbooks. Uh, and new terms that uh, most students and, and many adults until very recently have not been familiar with like structural racism. So exploring the vocabulary ahead of time, we always wanna start with that. And then this reading for understanding just kind of prepares the students for the topic of the day. One of the features on most of our maps in Panorama is this uh, kind of how to use this map section that I really like. Um, tips on how to look at what type of data or what type of resources they're gonna be able to find. So I'd like to sometimes start with this page with students and have them just sort of look at the types of images and icons and documents and maybe kind of turn and talk to a neighbor about what do you think this lesson is gonna be about or what do you think we're gonna find out today is a, is a good way to kind of get them to start activating um, their thinking. There is a button here that takes them out to the map so that you don't have to go and you know find it or have them type in a URL. So it launches directly out into the map so they can toggle back and forth between the learning resource and the map itself. Justin uh, demonstrated how to use the map the other day. So I'm gonna go back into our lesson. Um, and so once the kids have both the map and learning resource up on their page, I like to, if we're doing face-to-face -face instruction, oftentimes I'll put them in pairs so that one is kind of uh, driving the map while the other one is moving the learning resource along and displaying the activities and the questions. I find that that usually works pretty well to pair them up in that way. Um, we always start with a compelling question for each of the E's. The first E is engage. So in this case, um, how can maps help us visualize the segregationist housing policies of New Deal America? Um, so we have them kind of use the how, how to use this map image that we showed you a few moments ago and just give them time to explore on the map before we tell them anything else about it or before we jump right into step-by-step -step directions, I always wanna give them time to explore on the map. Um, this gets them kind of excited about the topic, but also they're gonna to start to 
become more familiar with these types of maps as you integrate them into your instruction. And they're probably going to teach us as teachers a few things. I find that whenever I work with students, they always find things that even maybe I didn't know the map could do. So um, give them a good bit of time to explore. But once they've had some time to do that, um, we do walk you through kind of step-by-step -step directions um, so that kids know where the tools are and how to locate them. So in this engage section, this is basically just uh, kind of a tutorial um, self-paced on just how to navigate the map. Um, and so we've got you know, the introduction, they wanna read that first, let them toggle between the map options that Justin shared with you in his video, show them how to zoom in and out, how to always get back to the home view or the national view. You know, a lot of kids who play with Google Earth or Google Maps are going to recognize similar icons, but some students aren't. So you don't want to assume that they automatically know how to use these types of maps. So give them some time to explore the tools. And then there's a really great introductory uh, piece that is embedded in the text from the map. And so having the kids do kind of a paired reading uh, of that introduction with a partner and alternating, taking turns between being the reader and the listener works on their listening skills and also their reading comprehension skills, and then have them do a turn and talk. You know, what did you find surprising? What was interesting about the topic? Did you see some of the new vocabulary in there? And what questions are you starting to have about the map? and have them do that back and forth with each section of the introduction. Uh, I think one of the um, examples that is highlighted in there is looking at the Savannah, Georgia. So discussing maybe how the maps for Savannah, Georgia are different from the maps for wherever they live, whether it be Richmond, Virginia, where we're holding this institute or um, you know, somewhere else that they may have lived before. And then continuing to familiarize themselves with the different tools of the map, asking them to find, you know, what are some of the different options they have? What do they see as they're changing the map into different settings or different views? And then having them talk a little bit about why the map is designed the way it is. Why did the cartographer choose uh, to present this data and visualize it in this particular way? So, we try as much as possible to zoom in and give kids um, as much guidance as we can, but still kind of keeping that whole inquiry, exploratory um, ability more on their part without us just telling them, giving them the directions, letting them explore and find it themselves. So that's kind of what the engage activity is all about. Um, having them start to do some comparisons between um, maybe a city that they're familiar with and, and another city that they were interested in exploring. Um, in this gallery view, you'll be able to look at uh, different images that are presented. So if they're comparing two cities, they can um, have a couple of different images to look through. And so that's how we kind of get them interested in the topic is through the engage uh, activity. So towards the end, wrapping up, asking them what patterns they're noticing, how the map changes, um, and what they're noticing as they're exploring the map. We always suggest some sort of formative assessment, such as an exit ticket. We don't. Um, we don't use the last E in our particular version of the five E's model, which is typically evaluate. Um, we tend to do an extension activity, but um, other than that, we follow a pretty basic five E model here. So the explore activity is now going to get them uh, starting to ground the use of the map into the, the time frame. So we're dealing with the New Deal uh, America, and the question here is, how did redlining contribute to decades of racial segregation in America? And so again, we're going over those terms like redlining and structural racism to get them to kind of look at the impact, long-term impact of these practices. So once again, they're going into the map and we're asking them to navigate to, in this case, we're using Kansas City as our example and having them start to do a little bit more deeper analysis on the map. So looking at what kind of information, having them explore 
and having them start to hover over those areas by grade that Justin shared with you um, in his earlier video. And then asking them, like, what are you noticing about the map as you hover over those colored bars? Um, have them start reading some of those descriptions and locating those places on the map and making observations. The other thing is talking a little bit about sources. So, the, you know, what kind of sources? Who made these maps? For what purpose? Why were they developed? Why they think they were created? And then looking at the similarities and differences between the, the different maps um, as they're being presented. And what language do you see on the map key that reflects that time period when they were created? Then we have them actually zoom out and look at uh, individual neighborhoods. So again, we're looking for patterns. We're looking for the way neighborhoods were grouped. Um, were they adjacent to an industrial or commercial use area? How about neighborhoods that are grouped in relation to bodies of water? And then having them talk about what differences they're seeing there. So that they'll start to perhaps see the differences. You know, waterfront property is usually not something that um, families in a red line neighborhood are, are going to be able to afford. Um, so we're usually going to look for real estate type patterns like that. Or are they right next to an industrial warehouse of some sort, which typically people with higher incomes don't want to live near industrial areas. So having them start to think a little bit about um, where people live and why they make the choices they do based on their income level and um, what is considered quote unquote good neighborhoods. Also, there's a lot of skill building involved with this particular map and especially so having them using things like the donut chart and the concentric circles. These are features that you'll see in other maps and that they will encounter in other situations. So we're constantly building up their skills um, in addition to teaching the content. So having them looking at different views on the map using different resources and different tools. Again, looking for patterns. Um, in this case, pulling in some math, looking at percentages, like what percentage of each of the graded categories do you see? I think Justin talked a little bit about that in his video as well. So trying to make this as cross-curricular as we can, having them relate to other content areas that they're studying, and then having them go out to pick another map, you know, go go pick another city that you haven't looked at, compare that to Kansas City. In this case, we're looking at Philadelphia. So having them kind of repeat the activity now on their own, now that they've had some practice, and then having them really zoom in on these graded areas um, and looking at things like where were the neighborhoods in relation to public spaces like a park or a hospital, a bank, a cemetery, um, and, and then talking a little bit about what those spatial relationships reveal about red line neighborhoods. In the explain activity, now we're asking, can we use historic maps and data to show a pattern of structural racism in New Deal America? So returning again to that national view, having them start now to look at those primary source documents that are embedded in the maps, the original, um, demographic information that was collected and the neighborhood descriptions that were written by the folks uh, that were realtors, local guides, people that were um, hired at the local level to help complete these uh, forms for the government. And then asking the students to look at that information and then notice how that is changing as they are clicking on different demographics, what is happening over here on the right hand side on the map. So starting off with a green coded neighborhood, looking at the description, seeing where those green neighborhoods are located um, and what they reflect between the two. And then the show scan button takes them to the original primary source. What are those adjectives and descriptive words that are used to describe the different color coded neighborhoods? And what else are they noticing about the way that those neighborhoods were evaluated as opposed to a yellow or a blue or a red neighborhood?
and then having them repeat those same steps for each of the other color coded areas. So going through from the green neighborhoods to the blue neighborhoods to the yellow ones to the red, um, looking at those clarifying remarks and uh, trying to see what patterns they are starting to, to find between uh, what was described for each type of neighborhood. I really like this full screen view because they can actually hover over the comments and click on them and it gives them like a zoomed in insert map uh, so they don't have to keep toggling back and forth. Um, and then encouraging them again to talk to a partner, start looking at some of the categories and some of the remarks. What does it mean to be detrimental versus favorable influences? Inhabitant types. Um, what kind of evidence are they seeing in there that goes back to this structural racism that was embedded in these documents that we see now continuing through decades later of systemic racism in our communities. So for elaborate, now we're taking the map um, and also using an article in Bunk. So if you watched our earlier video, you're a little bit familiar already with Bunk. So all of our panorama maps are embedded in Bunk so that students can make connections between the maps to different articles, different uh, points of view, making those connections through the tags, tagging system. So having students go out to an article on how redlining's racist effects have lasted for decades, um, having them look at that article and then start to look at some of the connected pieces. Now remember, the connections are not going to always be the same. So if you were to click on this article today, this would most likely not be necessarily the first connection that pops up because as we are adding new articles, and as you can imagine, in the last month or so, we've already had many articles have been added relating to the topic of redlining, given what's been going on in our country um, with the protests following the deaths of, of Mr. Floyd and others, um, and the discussion on police reform. Uh, so these changes are happening all the time. So when you're planning your lessons, you wanna make sure that you don't assume that this stack is gonna be um, stagnant. It is not, it will constantly change. The connections will change. The icons that you see here will change. The tags, when you um, click on those connections will change because Bunk is constantly adding new content, which is what makes it fresh and interesting for kids. But um, if, if you're not used to using it, you know, some folks will take a screenshot like this and then they get up in front of their students the next day and, and the view has changed on the live site and it kind of throws them at first. So make sure that you and your kids feel really comfortable with that, um, knowing that it's gonna be a dynamic um, uh, system that you're gonna be working with, um, which is great, which is okay. It's what keeps kids interested. Um, so having kids look at the connections between the two, um, having them select maybe one or two articles that they want to read and and get a new view or new perspective on how the maps could be used or how they um, lay out this case for how redlining is impacting communities of color in particular uh, today. So having them, again, working in partners, teaching them how to use those connections through Bunk, having them look at the tags, and what ideas would they explore um, on the map based on those topics and the tags related back to what they read in their earlier explorations of the maps themselves and the area descriptions and the primary documents. Um, and then have them, again, looking for similarities and differences. Working in groups of three or four, they could select a related card and read an excerpt and then have each person in their small group read a different excerpt and then have a discussion. What are, what are some things that they're reading about in these various articles on Bunk that um, are talking about redlining or talking about structural racism? And then what are they seeing perhaps in their own communities? Are there certain areas of town that they think would nowadays be graded um, or color coded a certain way? And what, what are your clues or what is on the physical landscape that would lead you to believe that. Um, and the activity for this is for them to then use um, their own creativity, produce a one-pager, 
sketch notes or an infographic and we give you some suggested resources on how they might produce their own. Uh, but having them visualize what they've learned about redlining um, in a creative way. We always include our citations um, for the maps so that um, we're modeling best research and, and learning for them if they're using one of our maps or one of our bunk excerpts for their National History Day projects or research report they're doing for you. We want to make sure we always provide that. Um, we also have a uh, comments uh, feedback form down here at the bottom and we would love to have all of you fill those out for any of our resources that you explore this week or moving forward. We're always looking for feedback. So I hope this gives you just a good overview through our learning resource for um, mapping inequality. I hope you'll consider piloting in your classrooms this year and providing us with some feedback or invite us in to uh, come and work with you and your students. So I enjoyed spending some time with you and look forward to the rest of the Institute.